thank you all for coming out. I have the dubious pleasure of being not only after two fantastic keynotes, but also lunch. So my duty is to try and keep you all awake as we kind of walk through a PowerShellers guide to Terraform. So first and foremost, why? Like, why do we, why do we care about this other tool? We're, we're here at a PowerShell conference, and you know, there's, there's this notion of DevOps and this concept that's there, but really what it comes down to is, is like this notion, this concept of multi-cloud is so hot right now that uh, you know, if you look at some of the surveys that are out there, uh, and I, I have a couple of them here, uh, but when you start talking to different organizations, and you start talking to them about what they're doing, what they're consuming, and where they're consuming it, it's all over the place. Like if we go back to probably the first time I ever came to one of these PowerShell summits, uh, you know, it was probably drastically different. Like these were probably single digits in terms of what kind of companies were interacting with multiple clouds, uh, much less seeing small businesses 60%, like that's crazy. That is a very large number uh, to use multiple cloud and multiple cloud services. And it's even more interesting when you spread this out across the different services themselves. So, you know, for a while, everybody thought of, you know, cloud as AWS, but that's not really the case. You know, even back in 2020, and, and this was the uh, results from Stack Overflow, it was, you know, AWS had a pretty good lead, Azure GCP were following right behind, and then we got into the Herokus and some of the others. Then we fast forward a year to 2021, results of the same exact survey, we see pretty much everything across the board double in terms of consumption. So like this is one of those cases where when you talk to folks and they're like, oh, we're not multiple cloud, we're not using multiple clouds, we're not going down that path. Uh, all of the data seems to suggest very much otherwise. So when you talk to these same companies and you talk to these same organizations about, okay, so what are your problems? What are your trials and tribulations in terms of getting to the point of using multi-cloud? Uh, this, our, our little bar graph is a little, uh, little off in terms of the, the skew there, but skill shortage is absolutely the number one by 57%. Uh, then we get into some of the other areas around inconsistent workflows being 33%, uh, and then just you know silos and things that, that DevOps principles really help to solve, following that up at, at around 29%. Then if we switch out and we take a little bit of a more business-focused look at this, uh, taking a, a survey from Accenture, when they talk to a lot of the, the C-levels, the high-level uh, individuals within amongst uh, a bunch of those organizations, they assume there's going to be 83% uh, shadow IT is going to increase over the next two years. And this also likely goes back to that whole, you know, this is a skills shortage problem. This is an inconsistent workflow problem. And so really what we're getting to here in this session is that this is not to tell you to, that you need to learn Terraform. Terraform is just another tool that goes in your toolbox. PowerShell, fantastic tool. I've used it forever. I would not be where I am today in my career without PowerShell. Terraform is also taking place right next to that in terms of the way that I manage environments and the way that everybody else in their organizations manage environments. So, you know, it's time to, you know, take a step back from the whole, like, all I have is a nail or a hammer and everything that I see are nails because there are multiple tools that can supply multiple different ways to getting to your end results. So with that, my name is Kyle Ruddy. Um, as a caveat, I do work for HashiCorp. I am in their technical marketing group where I lead the focus there on Terraform itself. However, this is not a sponsored session. I, this is a community session. Uh, I am very big on community events. As I said, I've been to the PowerShell Summit for the last probably five years at this point, uh, as well as multiple other conferences literally all over the world. Uh, everything that I do, I share. So if you hit me up on KM Ruddy, that's blog. Twitter, GitHub, pretty much everywhere that you can find me, that's where I'm at. Uh, and for a lot of these things that I've done, I've been recognized as a Microsoft MVP in the cloud and data center area. Hopefully, right now we're in the renewal time frame, so hopefully I make it to five years and get my blue chip. Though outside of that, I'm also big on the uh, VMware side of things. I've been a VMware v-expert now for 11 years. All right, so a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. First and foremost, we're gonna dive into a little bit of an introduction about what Terraform is, and then how we can use all of the skills that we know about PowerShell to start consuming Terraform. Uh, and then we get into a demo. So first and foremost, introduction to Terraform. 
bare bones. Terraform is HashiCorp's tooling to, uh, uh, is an infrastructure as code tool that lets you define both cloud and on-premises resources in human readable configuration files that you can version, reuse, and share. But really though, what's that actually mean? So this means that Terraform is declarative, meaning that what happens is that you create these files that declare what you want Terraform to make in your environment. It's immutable, meaning that uh, every time that you, uh, or, or basically this is, turns into the conversation uh, between you know, pets and farm animals, or house plants and crops, where every single time that you're going to be interacting with resources in your environment, chances are there could be uh, you know, a destroy and recreate in terms of that. This, these are not long-lived instances. Uh, it's item potent, meaning that every single time that you run a Terraform job, it's going to create the exact same resource on the back end. Nothing's going to be changing along the way. Uh, it is also opinionated, which can also get it into some trouble because you know, there's, a, there's a very kind of like HashiCorp way of you know, creating and managing resources, and that's kind of the way that it follows. Uh, but if, you, if you're not into the opinionated thing, we'll, we'll get into that later. It's also open source. You can go out to the GitHub page and literally read everything that Terraform does behind the scenes, including the providers. It's reusable, repeatable. It follows the whole GitOps principles that April Edwards was talking about earlier in her keynote. Uh, and lastly, same thing, collaborative. All right, so let's talk imperative versus declarative. Now, I'm gonna use an alligator because, well, I'm a Florida man, uh, so that's what we do, we talk about gators. So, on the left-hand side here, this is our imperative way of managing, say, an alligator. These are step-by-step -step instructions. Like literally, here's your, your parts and pieces. You have to have an intimate knowledge of how to build that alligator with these Legos. But then on the right-hand side, we have a different alligator. This is us just saying, you know, hey, declarative what manner? Build me an alligator. You know, it kind of looks different. And that's where the declarative use case kind of comes into play because all of a sudden, once we have this alligator, we need to be like, well, except we don't want it to be in whatever this is. We would rather it be Lego. We would rather it be completely green. We would rather it not have moving parts. Uh, so you kind of build it out uh, as you have defined it, and you let the tooling on the back end actually go through and manage it. Then we have mutable versus immutable. Uh, for those of you that are race fans, this last weekend was the Imola uh, Grand Prix for F1, so we're gonna use race cars. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is our mutable race car meaning that everything in this race car probably is going to change over time. You know, whether or not be, uh, you know, obviously tires, rims, chassis, engine, everything is going to change over time. It's a long-lived resource. On the right-hand side, that's going to be our show car. This is going to be those, you know, that concept of numbers matching, where, you know, it's always going to be the same. Every time it's recreated, you know, other than that VIN, uh, that's going to be the only thing that changes. All right, so getting into the actual like behind the scenes of what Terraform is doing, when it comes to the way that Terraform is defined, Terraform uses these blocks. So everything is a block to, to define everything in the, uh, within your infrastructure. So we start off with our Terraform block. This is the way that we tell the Terraform binary what it needs to do or who it needs to talk to. Then we have the provider block. The provider block just is how it talks to those external services. We have a slide spec uh, specific to that here in just a second. Then we have data blocks. Data blocks are read-only resources, meaning that uh, you know, since most of you are probably not gonna be working in any, uh, a fully greenfield environment, so you're gonna have to tell Terraform that it needs to know about certain things in the environment. Very similar to like a you know, get VM. You, know, you need to know information about that VM in order to pass it to something else. Then we have our resource block that's down here at the bottom. That is going to be our resources that are actually under management. Those are the things that we are defining that, tells, that allows Terraform to go out and actually create them. Then we get into what our configuration files are themselves. So here is just a very extremely basic configuration file. Up top we have our Terraform block saying that we need to go out and talk to Azure. Then we have our, our Azure block, for, or our provider block, saying that uh, uh, that includes whatever resources that we need to either talk to Azure, such as credentials, or some of the additional high-level features that we are not getting into as part of this session. And then down here at the bottom, it's just creating a very basic resource group. 
Uh, we can do things like give it a name. We can tell it which uh, location or availability zone to live in. Now, we can also build on top of that. So we can separate out all of these files or all of these blocks into different files, meaning that so up top, we can have our Terraform configuration in one file. We can have our providers block in a different file. We can have our resources in a different file. Or we can even break it down even further into specific you know, resources to kind of group those together. So like we could say, hey, we want our resource group into this one specific file. As long as it's in that single directory, Terraform is going to be able to ingest it and create things based on those files. Then we get into kind of the, uh, the hot button topic here that, uh, that is always important to know about, at least reference, and that's state files. Uh, this is pretty much the way underneath the covers that Terraform knows and understands what is going on with an infrastructure or within that service and what it's been or what it is supposed to be versus what it is today. This is kind of a, a comparison thing. Now, the reason that Terraform really has a state file is because it talks to all of these different services. So, you know, no matter if it's talking to GCP, Azure, and even vSphere, it has kind of a, a recollection of what's going on behind the scenes so that it can continue to, to check back in with that state file and make updates or plans or changes based on that. Um, this is something that we could get into, uh, you know, a little more of a, of a debate later, but that was kind of the general gist there. All right, then what do we do with this state file? Because this is, again, going to be something that's kind of important to your, to your infrastructure. It's going to literally be kind of like a run book for your infrastructure. So you probably don't want to check that into version control. You probably want to put that into some place that's safe. Uh, so up top, we have what's known as a cloud integration. This allows Terraform to send that uh, state file out to a service such as Terraform Cloud uh, so that you can store it securely and open it up to different team members. However, there are also backends. Uh, so here we have an example of an Azure RM backend that uses a storage blob within Azure to store our state file. Uh, we just have to give it you know, resource group name, storage name, uh, and a couple other things that go along with it just so that we can then share that amongst team members as well. All right, let's get into the actual knowledge transfer itself. Kind of what do I know now and what do I need to know? All right, so installation. Terraform is available on basically every package manager that's out there. Uh, if you're a Mac OS user, Homebrew, it's out there. HashiCorp has its own tap as well. Uh, so like the second Terraform drops uh, an update, it's available through the tap you know, within minutes. Uh, on Windows systems, you can use Chocolatey, Choco install Terraform. On Linux-based systems, it's you know, within whatever package manager you prefer. Then we get into the whole, like, well, how do I run Terraform? Where, where are my you know, verb dash nouns? Uh, and Terraform has four different commands that you're probably going to want to get familiar with. First and foremost, the Terraform init. This is the initialization phase. This is where it reaches out and says, OK, what, what providers do we need ha to have access to? Or what services are we going to talk to? Then we have Terraform plan, which is literally a plan. Terraform says, OK, these are the steps that we need in order to get to the end result of our configuration. We have apply, which is creating and provisioning all those resources, and then destroy to tear it all down. Then we get into the extending compatibility or talking to other services. So you know, for, for those of us that have used PowerShell for a long time, it's the PowerShell gallery. When it comes to Terraform, it's the Terraform registry. So this is a place that has over 2,000 different providers, and providers are those things that, that allows Terraform to talk to those different services. Uh, and then it also has some other things that are known as modules, both of which we'll get to here in just a second. So then how do we connect to services? You know, what if, what's like a, a connect Azure RM uh, account in terms of Terraform? And this is where we get back to our provider block. So here we have the provider Azure RM. There we can set things such as subscription ID, client ID, client secret, and uh, tenant ID. Or if that's not the way that you're doing it, it can also have integrations into your Azure CLI if you're authenticated through that means. And then yes, we do have modules. Terraform has modules as well. And basically it works in a very similar fashion to the way that PowerShell modules work because it comes down to reusable code. So this same to PowerShell modules, same to commandlets, same to functions, same to literally anything that you can share within, like, say, the PowerShell gallery. 
Uh, so what we have here is, is up top, we have just a, a very blanket basic resource group creation. And then down here at the bottom, it's the simplified way that we can call that module. So this, you know, our example here, not that great due to, uh, you know, the small real estate that I have as far as screen size. But when you get into creating larger applications, larger environments, uh, you know, things of that nature, this becomes really, really powerful. And that's part of the demo that I have later. Then functions themselves. Uh, so Terraform does have some internal capabilities to interact with both functions and expressions. So you can interact with lists. You can interact with file systems. You can you know, test out whether it's not something's true, false, or, or Boolean value. And yes, even if you wanted to, there are some regex expressions in there too. Uh, not that I would advise that, but regex does have a place every now and then. Then we get into variable types because Terraform also makes use of the same concept of what PowerShell has within uh, variables. It has typing, so up top we can see that we have our variable of RG name. We can give it a type. We can give it a, a description. We can even then build on top of that to do some added val uh, validation as well. So down here in our middle section, we have a variable called VM size. It's again a type of string, and then we can do some validation. So basically, we're we're looking for something that's uh, somewhere between zero or one and nine characters long, and it starts with standard underscore, because that's we're trying to match that up to a input variable that matches that. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, another kind of key call out here, you can either call variables at the command line, you can do like a, a Terraform plan dash var, or you can create a tf vars file and put in Terraform or your variables into that file. Uh, another key thing for, for our TF vars file, uh, again, highly recommend using this with source control, but this is one of those files where you're gonna wanna use like a .git ignore so that you don't commit that to version control just so that you don't uh, submit you know, credentials or secrets or certificates, things of that nature. All right, so what else you got? So when it comes to things like write output, we can also use outputs within Terraform as well. This is really helpful, uh, specifically when we're interacting with, say, modules, so that we can take output from one particular area and send it to another. Uh, in this case, we have what's known as an output block. You know, something very you know, straightforward here. It's just value and then telling it, you know, I want our resource of Azure RM resource group .rg, and then we want the name output from that particular resource and that's what's going to either be returned to the screen or returned back to uh, your configuration itself. All right, so diving into some of the actual like talking, working with Terraform itself, what about IntelliSense? Like that's a huge part of working and operating within the, the PowerShell ecosystem, and Terraform has that as well. Uh, there's actually a, a pretty popular extension that's available through VS Code, you know, literally called HashiCorp Terraform, However, the key point behind that is that there is also a language server. This language server allows you to also have the same IntelliSense type look, feel, and, and activity within other IDEs as well. So if, say, you don't like VS Code for whatever terrible reason, you could use it with, say, Sublime, or you could use it with JetBrains, or you know, anything along those lines as well. So very extensive in that case. Then what happens to automating Terraform? Like how do we, so we have this, our configuration, but how do we like make it do something uh, in a programmatic way? So you can either do something as simple as, you know, local executions or cron jobs, schedule tasks, uh, any of those things absolutely work. You can start integrating into your source, source control and or, you know, CI CD pipelines, uh, meaning our uh, example up here is basically using a, I believe this was a circle CI example. So it pulls out the, a, um, a Terraform image from Docker Hub and just says, you know, hey, by the way, Terraform apply and then auto approve it. So, you know, every time there's a commit or a pull request that goes into your source control, boom, it's going to automatically go out, talk to your services and execute that latest and greatest code. Then also you have other miscellaneous services that are out there like a Terraform cloud that can you know, have and run webhook type extensions. You can perform remote executions and even get into the case of API driven workflows. Uh, and Terraform cloud is not the only one that's out there. There's actually quite a few. 
So I've talked a lot about files and configurations and blocks, and, but the one thing that I haven't talked about is an interactive console. So you're probably thinking that there's no interactive console, and technically Terraform does, but it's not really the same as what you're thinking. So the Terraform console command is literally a way that you can step into a configuration file and start to interact with some of the parts and pieces that are within there. This is extremely helpful when you need to say, I don't know, figure out what a variable actually is. If you have something that's coming up malformed, if you need to test an expression, like say our, our bottom, our CiderNet mask expression, or you know, test what your output should be. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a really cool way to, to kind of debug your, debug your code or, or test out what uh, some features or functionalities might look like. Then we get into the more programmatic way. As I mentioned in the beginning, Terraform is opinionated by nature, but what happens if you don't like that opinionated workflow? Well, there's something that's known as the Cloud Development Kit for Terraform, or CDKTF. This is something that we've kind of adopted from our good friends at AWS, and this allows us to turn Terraform into kind of a SDK, or really CDK, if you will. So you can use, say, C Sharp, to go through and get to those low-level programmatic ways that you're probably more familiar with, if that's your preference. Uh, there's also support for Go, Python, and TypeScript. All right, here's a really cool thing. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody here that might be from Microsoft, so hopefully I am not uh, destroying anything for lightning rounds or things of that nature. Uh, but there is a really cool tool that's out there if you already have resources that exist in Azure but are not codified yet. Uh, this is known as Azure Terrify, uh, which personally, putting back on my HashiCorp hat, could have had a better name, but uh, I digress. Uh, it is still a really cool feature. Nonetheless, it allows you to, to run this command. Uh, so what, what you see here is, is you have the Azure Terrify kind of interactive console here. You can see that the Ruddy Azure, or AZTFY, which is the actual name that you uh, call by, uh, by the binary, and then demo, and that's my, my resource group. So then what happens is Azure Terrify reaches out to that resource group, says, hey, these are all the resources that we see that are out there that have been provisioned. Would you like to make these or put these into Terraform code? Uh, it, and it works quite well. Uh, there, there are a couple little nitpicks and caveats, but uh, it, it works exceptionally well for, for the status that it's in. All right, demo time. This is where we get to see how well the Wi-Fi is working. Yes, I, I consider fine to be very good most days. All right, so here's what uh, a configuration that that we have, this is going to basically go out, stand up a, a very basic website and, and configuration that, that's gonna say hi to you all. So what I'm going to do first is open up our, our console here. Uh, we can do a Terraform init. And that's literally going through, grabbing modules, uh, grabbing providers, so we can see you know, some of the things that have already been pulled in and installed previously, so I don't have to rely on, on the network completely. Uh, key points here are like, say, the uh, Azure RM provider, because I'm, I'm creating stuff in Azure. So now let's clear that out and do a Terraform apply, because we're going to skip the plan, because that just takes longer. So as that's running, let's go back to our, oh wow, that was fast. All right, Wi-Fi is, or wired network is doing well. So here's kind of an output of all the things that it needs to, to accomplish, to, to plan through, before it actually creates all of these things. And I'll show you the, the code for it here in just a second, but like most importantly, like here is a Azure virtual machine, because uh, what we're doing is standing up a Linux box and then uh, running a script inside of it to get to our, uh, our web application. And what it's going to do afterwards, the important part here is that one, it's going to tell us our plan. It says we're going to add 10 new things, so you know exactly what it's doing before you even hit yes. Uh, and there's going to be no changes and zero things to destroy. Then we're gonna see some outputs there at the end. Uh, so let's type in yes to let that go do its magic because that's got about five minutes probably. So going through our configuration file itself as that runs there, down there at the bottom. Starting up top, we have our, our Terraform block. 
this is going through and telling us that we're going to talk to Azure RM, and then we're going to talk to a random provider, because I'm just randomly generating certain names and, and things within the environment, so uh, because I don't really care what the name is. More part of that whole like you know farm animal crops uh, portion. Then you can even do things such as defining and telling it exactly what Terraform version you want it to be at. Uh, here we have our, our provider block. Uh, this is where I'm going through and, and adding in all the parts and pieces that, that lets it know how I authenticate to Azure. Then here's the, the really cool part where we get into modules. So I have this broken down into two different modules. Uh, the top one is one that we call ARM Web App. And all it asks for is a prefix and a location. Then down here at the bottom, our next one is the web config. Uh, this, is, this is going to take the output from our web app and actually apply the configuration for our website. And these are, the important part here is that these are, are extremely basic in terms of repeatability, reusability. Um, all of these done, are, all of these things are, are done on the back end. So if we open up our variables file here, Here's some of the things that, uh, that we've gone through and, and kind of defined as ter in terms of what we want to see. Uh, so we have subscription ID, client ID, authentication stuff. For our prefix, we can even put in default values. Uh, so since I did not give it any other variables, it's going to use uh, Ruddy PowerShell Summit. It's going to deploy to the East US 2 region. Uh, and then we're getting into a, uh, another kind of really crazy one where we're, we're using validation because we're looking for an input of either products, uh, HashiCat, or HashiDog. Uh, I did that because, well, I did one with, with HashiCat, and then people told me not everybody loves cats. So I did one with HashiDogs, and people told me not everybody loves dogs, and I'm just like, okay, well, we're gonna do products then instead. Uh, lastly, what we saw earlier with our outputs is we're going to ask for a couple different things, mainly resource group name, virtual machine name, and then the FQDN to reach out to that web uh, URL. So with all that, I think we're still, yeah, still, still creating down there at the bottom, so let's take a look at our modules. Uh, so in this case, we're using local modules that live uh, within our configuration. So we have our, our ARM web app that's right here. If we open this up, we can see that there's, you know, 116 lines of code that's been condensed into about five. Uh, for when we call our, our, uh, our module. So we have, uh, we're creating a resource group. We're creating a virtual network. We're creating a subnet. And based on that, we have a security group that not only creates that, but we also have a bunch of security rules so that we can talk to it over port 8080, or sorry, 80, and I think 443, uh, and SSH because that'll be, SSH will be important here in a second for our web configuration, because uh, that's doing some pretty crazy stuff that kinda sorta isn't really uh, provisioning and infrastructure as code, it's more config management. Uh, but then we have our network interface, you know, where we're starting to take some of our, our prior areas here, uh, such as our subnet and subnet ID, we could see IntelliSense kinda kicking in, uh, and, and you know, helping assign what that type of resource is then a public IP, then we get into our virtual machine itself. Uh, so we're, we're picking up some different, different variables that we've defined as part of this module that we've also uh, assigned as default. And I believe that is it. All right, so we're still creating. We're at three minutes and 50 seconds, uh, which should be about right to where it, it kicks in and actually wraps up. But we do have a backup just in case that doesn't. Uh, so let's look at our other module that's here. Uh, so with this, we're doing something really crazy to, to kind of pull in a bunch of different sets of information. This is where we're getting into a little bit of a more advanced topic area. Uh, so we have this notion of a local block, and the local block allows you to do a lot of things um, that, that has no outside re or expectations or requirements. So in this case, I'm taking all of those different, those different variable or sets of variables and wrapping them up into one specific variable called the data set. And down here at the bottom, this is where we're calling that local data set. 
Um, again, this is, a, this is kind of more of a, a, a more advanced kind of abstract way to do it, but allows me to, to kind of choose in between uh, a set of three different maps. And this is our, our random integer here that just picks out one random item from those maps. And we have a shuffle, again, to, to pull out different information. Then here's where we get into, uh-oh, do I see an error? We do have an error. All right, good. I'm glad I, I defined or uh, I set up a backup earlier. So here, this is uh, another one of those areas where we can do some, some crazy stuff that's not really uh, provisioning infrastructure as code. It's more configuration management. Uh, so in this, we're using what's known as a null resource. And this allows us to SSH into our virtual machine that we created. Uh, that's this uh, connection block that's right here. Then we are sending over a file. This is what's going to be available as part of our website there. Uh, and then we're using a remote execution uh, provisioner. This just allows us to use that SSH connection to then run these different commands within that virtual machine. Uh, so the important parts on here is that we're, one, we're doing updates, uh, two, we're installing an Apache, uh, and then we're using our, the file that we copied over for our, uh, this last string right here, which is giving it some of our information from that map. All right, so let's go back to our terminal here, see what those actually were. File provisioning error, that's fun. So let's go back to our previously run configuration here. Here we go. All right, so in the case of that demo failing, which it did spectacularly, uh, here is what we should see as the, the output here. So we, we had a bunch of resources that were, that were created. Uh, note it only has eight, even though the plan was 10, because some of those are actually null resources, and therefore like, it's not counted within Azure itself. But then here we can see the, the outputs that we defined earlier. So here we have Ruddy PowerShell Summit, and you know, this is my backup app, so it has backup in the title, so I don't overrun it, uh, overwrite anything as far as the resource group name. If we jump out to Chrome, in this case it's going to say, uh, Terraform says hello from our FQDN instead of an IP. So to go back to our configuration here, I'll show you what the other items that were possible were. Close that. So in case of our, our products variable, uh, we had a map. So we either had the PowerShell hero, we had PowerShell itself, Terraform, and then we had DSC. Uh, and then for like the Hashi cats, we had a bunch of different cats and using place kitten on the back end for those. And the same thing for Ashi dogs and pulling those out too. All right. So we're at 134. So I actually do have just a bit of time to show you the other really, really cool thing that hopefully doesn't upset anybody doing lightning demos. So since our initial one failed, I'm going to open up our, our backup that I ran from before and show you what Azure Terrify ends up creating. So in terms of, of Azure Terrify, uh, going back to, to the screen image before, it gives you a, a list of all the resources that are found within the resource group uh, that you specified. And then as long as you either A, follow the guidelines for what it are automatically assigned, or you update it to include uh, particular ones, it then builds out this configuration uh, that we see here. So we have certain things such as, you know, we have our subnet group that's here. Um, a couple of the things that I do want to call out when it does create this is this is a very static configuration, meaning that there's no variables whatsoever. So if you do want to go through and add such as a, a name prefix, that's something that, that you have to do. Um, it also heavily de uh, depends on the depends on statement uh, within the resource. And that just basically means that you know, for, in this case, uh, the Azure RM subnet, it is going to rely on or depend on the virtual network being created first. Uh, and then the other interesting thing that it pulls out for those of you who have seen Terraform configurations before, 
Uh, we have the, the name. It auto-generates the name as well. Uh, so in this case, the resource, when we refer to it later, is Azure RM Resource Group. Uh, in this case, it shows up as Res9 uh, as the name. You can change those in Terrify itself, uh, or you can use the auto-generated ones, and then you can kind of refactor it later. Uh, but it does go through. It does do a couple things in a different, uh, different configuration. Uh, but for the most part, it, it's, it's very accurate, uh, very well done. Um, ah, here's one of the, uh, one of the areas. Uh, so here, instead of having the security um, rules themselves being part of the security group, it actually built those out. It expanded those into their own different resources. Uh, so these are a little more verbose, um, and, but they're in their own resources. So it allows you a little more flexibility than, than what I had actually created initially through the demo. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, then we have our network interfaces um, and IPs. I mean, it, it auto-generated everything. Um, and I've already torn down this environment because uh, this one was actually done last night. Uh, so literally, you could take this configuration, you could open up Terraform, and if you're in that directory, you could run a Terraform plan, and it would tell you, you know, there's nothing to do. This is accurate. Uh, as per the state that it found in, in Azure and therefore generated the uh, state file, which is also here in our, uh, in our area here. Uh, oh, the big thing, it, it did move the provider and Terraform block into its own file. Uh, and then it also includes a resource mapping uh, for after the fact. So it, you know, it has an idea of like, this is what, this is what we found. And this is what we mapped it to in terms of uh, on the Terraform side itself. So with that, so last up, more information. Where can you find some additional info, um, things that you can do like walkthroughs. Um, the HashiCorp Learn site is a great website. <laughs> Um, it's broken down into many different areas where you can focus on uh, different aspects. So uh, there's a Azure uh, kind of subsection, there's a native US subsection, there's a Kubernetes subsection, there's a vSphere <coughs> subsection. Um, and each one of these are, are meant and built to essentially allow you to go through and walk through it with free accounts. So you don't really have to pay for anything as uh, you, know, you kind of go through the process of learning Terraform. Uh, the documentation, uh, it, we hear very good things about the documentation. I'm fairly proud of the way that that uh, works out right now. It's literally terraform.io docs. Uh, the community is, is fairly large. Um, in this case, what, uh, what HashiCorp has done is they rely on the Discuss forums or the GitHub re repositories themselves for a lot of the community efforts. Um, so for that, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, in terms of like Slack groups and things of that nature, it's kind of fragmented, which is unfortunate, but uh, it makes up for it in other places. Uh, the Terraform registry is registry.terraform.io. Uh, and then also Azure has done a fantastic job of building out uh, documentation to support Terraform, uh, the Azure RM provider, uh, and either, even some of the new stuff that's coming down the, down the pipe with like uh, Azure API, uh, which is a new provider that talks directly to Azure's API, like as the name says. Um, Azure AD was another one. I think there's like six or seven different providers as well that Azure works with. Um, and then, of course, the Azure Terrify uh, GitHub repo that's there as well. So with that, that's all I've got. So if, I think we have like five minutes left if people have questions or comments or throwing tomatoes. No tomatoes? No, no tomatoes during lunch? Um, no, this is Microsoft mostly, um, so we have apples. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love the name Terrify. <laughs> uh, yes? Are there any other providers that create Terrify tools? Yeah, so, so the question is, is about uh, whether or not there are going to be other areas where you can automatically generate Terraform uh, configurations like this. Um, and there actually are uh, several that are out there. Um, this isn't even the first one that Azure has done. Uh, there's also one that's out there that's a little more, um, uh, it, it covers many different providers and it's actually created by GCP uh, and it's called Terraformer. 
Um, so that one's kind of cool. It does uh, AWS, GCP, Azure, uh, vSphere. Uh, it does a couple different Kubernetes services. Uh, so it's, it's not like all of the providers, but there's, you know, it's a solid set of providers that a lot of folks are using. Correct, yeah, so, so the question is around those depends on blocks that, that Azure Terrify created, uh, and, and those are 100% not required. That's something that, that Terraform actually handles extremely well underneath the covers. It already has a mapping of those dependencies uh, that have been established and created when the provider is created. Uh, so like literally I could go through, rip all those out, and it'll still run. Do you, do you have a guide to not just using Terraform, but also developing new providers for it? Uh, so the question is around developing new providers for Terraform, and yes, we do. Um, it is out there on the registry, so registry.terraform.io, uh, and there is a, I want to say it's publishing. There's a, there's a doc that's already out there, because it, it kind of follows the standards, because we also, like, one of the things that the, the registry has is this notion of official providers, which are ones that, that we, as, or I should say HashiCorp, uh, works on, supports, and, and whatnot. Uh, then there are verified providers, which are ones that are done by partners and, and other folks that are, are within the, uh, the ecosystem. And then there's community. Uh, and so there's guidelines for each one of those in, in terms of how they work out. Cool. Well, with that, I will uh, let you all go. I will be around all week as well. So if you want to uh, discuss or you know, talk about more things, feel free, to, feel free to reach out and grab me.